Mr. O'Gorick is an assistant professor in the physical education department at Slippery Rock University in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania, and aquatic consultant for aquatic safety resources. He earned his BS in education and health and physical education with an emphasis in aquatic administration at Indiana University of Pennsylvania in 1989 and earned his Master of Education degree in Physical Education and Aquatic Administration at Slippery Rock University in 1996. He holds numerous certifications such as American Red Cross Water Safety Instructor Trainer, Lifeguard Instructor Trainer, NAWI and SEI Open Water Scuba Instructor, EMT and Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission Boating Instructor, just to name a few. Mr. O'Gurk is the driving force in developing Slippery Rock University's aquatic minor. Mr. O'Gorick has had the honor of working on the American Red Cross Water Safety Advisory Group that revised the Water Safety Instructors Program in 2004. He has also worked as a technical reviewer for their lifeguard manuals. He has contributed to the United States Life Saving Association, the YMCA, and Star Guard lifeguard textbooks. He currently serves as the president of the National Drowning Prevention Alliance and the aquatic chair of the PSA HPERD. Mr. O'Gorick's presentation this afternoon is titled Scanning, Target, Assess, Rescue, and Remove, better known as STAR, which is a method for responding to aquatic emergencies. The purpose of this session is to provide lifeguard instructors, training officers, and lifeguards with a basic tool to use when educating lifeguards in the methods and techniques for responding to aquatic emergencies. I have a hand for Mr. O'Gorick. Thank you, Cliff. Very loud. <laughs> um, welcome to this afternoon's session. Um, hopefully we'll be able to give you some uh, pertinent information to take a look at probably many topics that you're already doing uh, in your training programs, but in a way that can tie the various components together to give you a comprehensive look as far as responding to scanning, raking rescues, and the entire um, aspect of aquatic emergencies. Uh, as Cliff mentioned, I, I do teach at Slippery Rock University. I'm an assistant professor. Uh, we do have an aquatic minor. Um, talked to um, uh, some of you about um, the numbers of students we have. We have 80 students that are in an aquatic minor at our university. Um, in addition to my work at the university, I do do a fair amount of work in public safety. And um, I want to highlight some of those aspects so that you can tie into this particular presentation. I spent 25 years working as a lifeguard, predominantly in the open water. Um, most recently, I retired from Ocean City Beach Patrol. That's in New Jersey, two ocean cities. Um, so I'm a Jersey boy. Uh, but I worked for Ocean City, New Jersey, where I was a lieutenant and training officer. Prior to that, I worked for Wildwood Crest Beach Patrol, where I worked as a lifeguard and an instructor and a coach. And then I also put a stint in before I went and did those. Uh, to uh, particular organizations with the Pennsylvania State Park Systems, uh, which was another open waterfront facility. Um, so hopefully when I'm talking today, you may hear me talk a little bit more on the open water experience because that's a bulk of what I've done in the summers, but also I'm training guards like you are for other variety um, of places such as pools, water parks, so on and so forth. Um, I am pinch hitting today. Um, I did help develop this presentation, but some of you when you originally signed up you may have noticed, if you looked at who was presenting, was Kim Tyson. Um, Kim Tyson is um, uh, an aquatic lecturer at the University of Texas. Uh, Kim was not able to make um, the trip, but I was presenting the next presentation after this. And since we co-developed this particular program, I got um, put in here. So uh, I'm not Kim, I'm, I'm Bob. So, uh, but we also, like I said, co-developed this. So the STAR method. How many um, instructors do I have, lifeguard instructors in here? Just about everyone. I'm preaching to the choir, all right? So what occurred a number of years ago when um, Kim and I were both working at Wildwood Crest, uh, we'd go through our rookie school. And, um, you know, we've trained guards at the university um, through aquatic schools and other variety of activities. And obviously our training with the beach patrol uh, lent itself to um, some major amounts of time and training. And we did what everyone else did. You teach CPR for a component. Get that down. Students, your lifeguard candidates look great. Then we'd go to our pool session, work on our contact rescues. They get that component down. We'd talk about how and what to look for as far as emergencies. 
and it appears that everybody knows how to recognize what somebody looks like when they're in distress or when they're drowning. And we do our first aid procedures and a whole bunch of other stuff. What we were finding, though, was as good as those candidates were, as super as they were, and we'd walk out and go, man, these, this is a great group of young men and women prepared to set on our beaches and guard, you know, 80 to 75,000 people. But what we were finding was the disconnect. They'd get on the chair, and we'd do some shadow guarding and mentoring, and we'd go up to them and go, are you going to go and prevent that situation if it was a prevent, or are you going to go and make a rescue? And as good as they were at each of the skills, they're having a difficult time putting it all together. And if they actually went out and made the rescue and did a great job, once they got onto the shore or onto the deck, they often did what? My job's done. What they didn't realize was there were still a whole heck of a lot of other things that needed to be done. Records and reports. A lot of times we'd find that they didn't call in. They made the rescue. We heard it on the radio. Well, how many victims? How many lifeguards? But what they weren't doing is they weren't going from A to Z, and they were having a hard time remembering all that. Yet, they were some of our best lifeguard candidates doing what? Understanding each and every one of the components. We were not connecting the dots throughout the process. So one night after training and evaluation and some pizza and some cold pops and so on and so forth, uh, we sat around and said, what are some of the critical components that we as lifeguards aquatic facility people need to emphasize every single day with lifeguards. And if you hear, and it's no different between the beach and the pools and the water parks, our mantra has always been, watch the water. Watch the water, watch the water, watch the water, watch the water. But we need to make sure that we know how we're watching the water, how we're targeting, how are we assessing people. And then when should we activate those emergency action plans? Which I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. But this acronym will hopefully give you a little different thought process as far as helping your lifeguards or your lifeguard candidates throughout the process. So we try to look at the broad scope, is that the S should be scanning. Our number one job as lifeguards is to watch the water. Right. Make sure their eyes are on the water. Make sure the lifeguards actually know their assigned areas. Make sure they know their zones. Make sure that they understand everything that they're responsible for in that particular area, whether it's guarding in the South Jersey area, whether it's lifeguarding at a waterfront in western Pennsylvania, or setting at the community pool. What is the area that you're assigned and what you're responsible for? And I kind of look at it as driver education. Remember way back in the day when you had driver's ed and they said, look at the big view, the big picture? So I look at scanning in the same way. We have the big picture, and then we're, as that's focusing, then we also then do what? We start to look at smaller, more detailed things. And that's how we're going to take you through this particular presentation. Now, observation methods. There's a lot that's out there. I just put a few of these up here. Now, the interesting thing is that that I want to throw out your way, and I, about two weeks ago, I, I do work as an EMT, I'm a licensed EMT, and I was at one of my uh, update um, workshops for CEUs, and it was on traumatic brain injuries, and, and the emergency room physician um, made a, a comment that I've heard before, but kind of resonated again. And the comment was, the mind doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. The mind doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. So when we're talking about scanning and observation techniques, if that 17-year-old lifeguard candidate doesn't know what somebody looks like in distress, the mind doesn't recognize it. So we need to, as facility operators, as instructors, as training officers, we need to engage those students, those candidates, our current lifeguards, to make sure that there is a connect, is that their mind understands what they're seeing is something that they're going to either have to intervene on or that is safe or is an unsafe practice. So the mind doesn't see what the mind doesn't know. So during this, we need to make sure that our lifeguards understand and know what a person in distress looks like. They need to understand what a person that's drowning looks like. 
And that, once again, as we move through this, there will be more clarity. So whether you use a five-minute scan, whether you use the 10-20 rule, whether you use some other observation techniques that um, other agencies use, you're looking at the big, broad picture, if you will. Um, I've also put up things like the block or the group method. Now, everybody, I bet if I took a portion of the room and asked you, how do you scan? There would be some similarities, but we'd also look at things differently. I'd also like to look at it like going to a museum and taking a look at a piece of art or a painting. Take the three of you and take me, the four of us. We may interpret that in many different ways. As lifeguards, think about how we interpret what we see in the water. Just because I use a block method and what I see could be completely different than somebody else. So when I'm sitting on the beach and I'm lifeguarding, I like to do a block or a group method, and I like to go left to right, front to back, so on and so forth. But how I interpret it may be completely different than how Lee's interpreting it. What I see are shapes and numbers and blocks. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care how you do your shapes and your blocks as long as you're what? Making sure you're assessing what is there. So we can talk about scanning all we want. If you're not doing assessment on it, you've got disconnect. Right? So you can do your different things on a, a PowerPoint or show the methods as far as moving, and I encourage you to do all that, but the next part needs to be more of a detailed function. So look at the big picture as far as your observation, observation techniques, and then start to take a look down from there. Now, with scanning, I know some of you are going to go, what in the heck? Why do we have equipment and platforms and this stuff up here? This all plays a pivotal role in our scanning. All right, equipment, whether you're using a rescue tube, a rescue can, uh, your PPEs, where is all that stuff located? And how does it play a role in your scanning process in with the STAR method? As a pool lifeguard, the rescue tube should be, strap should be on, and the tube should be where? <laughs> That's where we normally find with some places. It should be in our laps. But we don't see that sometimes at certain facilities. So if it is underneath the feet, does it affect the STAR principle? Most certainly. So everything has an effect on what we do or response time. So knowing where your tube's at, knowing where your rescue can's at, uh, when I guarded Ocean City, all right, the lifeguard can's not on her lap, it's on a post. But knowing how to get it off the post and to make a rescue plays an important role. Your platforms, are they elevated? Are they deck level? Is that going to give you a different view on your scanning? Most certainly. All right. uh, are they a roving guard? Are they moving? Um, in the open water, um, sometimes we apply what we call in the South Jersey, we call it layoffs. layoffs. We actually put a lifeguard in the water, out amongst the group, and they're kind of like a sheepdog, if you will. Right? South Jersey is real popular as far as putting um, Van Dyne rowboats out at the perimeters to keep the crowds in. If you've been to South Jersey, you've, you've seen this. But in many cases, if we won't put the boat out, we'll put a lifeguard out. So um, that is an in-water type of uh, moving thing. They don't have the height, but they are also a lot closer to where? your patrons. They can, they can see and make some assessments and evaluations there. Um, towers. Uh, let me take a, a West Coast view. We don't really use it here on the East Coast, but how many people have heard of zero base guarding? Zero tower guarding? Anybody? Zero tower guarding is what's used in like Huntington Beach, um, Newport Beach. It's kind of like Big Brother. They have a person in a big tower and they set up there with Binoculars, big, huge, powerful binoculars. They actually have now, it's more digitally. And they are the big brother in the sky, if you will. And they can see their whole beach. And then what they'll do is they'll deploy people from that zero base guarding. They'll say, Tower 14, you have four people on a rip, go. Tower 2, you have an incident here. It's called zero base guarding. It's a little different employee technique, but it's still part of the scanning process. We don't really use it so much on the East Coast but I want to share with you, it is another way that look and another layering effect as far as your scanning. Um, visuals. Um, 
How many people use binoculars? If you're pool guards, you're probably not obviously using them, but if you're at a waterfront, do I have any waterfront people in here? Beach? I know we've got uh, a couple beach people. Um, you know, we encourage all our, our lifeguards to have binoculars if they're at a waterfront. All right? Sunglasses. I think it's a no-brainer, but when I first started guarding, I actually had people I guarded with that refused to wear sunglasses. Hard to imagine that, but it plays a vital role because we want them to be able to see. All right, and see into the water with polarized glasses. So these will all play a part of uh, some essentials with your scanning process. We need to constantly evaluate the swimmers. Constant evaluation. Not just sitting there, but actually engaging ourselves to what the people are doing. All right, now I got stuck on 95 driving down from Pittsburgh and so it was pretty slow. So, um, you know, with the radio and moving around and that, so I was seeing different things. But there's been times where I've been driving on I-95 for hours, and I kind of shake my head and go, wow, that's like, that's to be another 100 miles away from south of the border. And I really didn't realize what I saw for that 100 miles. How many people have done that? All right. All right. Am I evaluating anything at that point? And let's face the reality. The guards that aren't getting an adequate rotation, they got that empty filled myopia, if you will. It's the I-95 syndrome. They're sitting there, and just because they're sitting there doesn't mean they're doing what? Watching anything that's going on. Are they truly evaluating that? Are they truly seeing the stuff that is happening? And if they are, are they willing to engage to say, you need to move into shallower water, or stop throwing the beach ball, or, you know, um, you know, the various things that we see that we need to intervene on. So we need to constantly evaluate what the situation is. When I transferred from Iowa Crest to Ocean City, um, I was um, told I needed to make sure that I spent um, some time on a place called Ninth Street Beach. Is anybody familiar with Ocean City, New Jersey? All right, Ninth Street Beach is considered the roughest beach or the most dangerous beach. And they said, well, we want to put you there. And uh, I remember midway through the summer, uh, one of the lieutenants came up and said, oh, you're, you're having an easy summer, not a whole lot of rescues here compared to some of the other years. And, um, and I said, well, are you watching how we're guarding this? And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, this is a pretty simple beach to guard if you're constantly engaging the crowd. Because it's a short, narrow, little beach with a nasty jetty it's a hooking jetty with pipes and all this thing. So it's not a large beach. But if you don't keep your crowd in control, it can go to hell in a handbasket real quick. But if you keep on it, you can keep your crowd tight, so to speak. And my point was is that if you let your guard down, you're going to have people in the freight train making rescues all day long. But if you're keeping a constant vigilance on your crowd, whether it's Ninth Street Beach or that community pool or the water park, you're constantly evaluating your swimmers. You're controlling what your environment is. And at the end of the day, you should be pretty tired if you're doing your job right as a lifeguard. Right. Um, some qu simple quotes here that I put up, and I'm sure that you could probably put another 50 on here. But when I'm scanning, I also just try to uh, remind regards of simple things like this. What goes down must come up. Every little kid's going to do what? They're going to go down, they're going to play games, and so on and so forth. I don't need to do this, but I can scan and know that I need to come back and make sure that that person came up. All right? And sometimes we have guards that just fixate. I'm going to watch till that person comes up. I can still, I just need to check back. I need to track that person. Keep your number straight. This is one that I like. If I got a block of four, I got a block of five, I got a block of three, I got a block of two, a block of one. Keeping my number straight means that block of four turns into a three. Where is number four? Oh, number four is walking out of the pool. I'm keeping my number straight. All right, there was a group of five, now it's a group of nine. Well, I, I'm now adding those groups together. So I always say keep your number straight, know what your blocks are, Keep your number straight and know what went in and what went out. Now, I'm not asking you to sit there and go, there's 200 people in the water. 
for an exact count, but it's a way to, once again, engage your process as far as the scanning. All right, lock on the high-risk bathers. Uh, you know, you hear different things as far as police, as far as profiling, and so on and so forth. But we know through statistics, right, this should be a little bit updated, so some of you may be writing that are going, well, wait a minute, it's the numbers. Um, we know that there's probably between three to 4,000 individuals that drown every year through the CDC. And we also, if you aren't aware of it, you can go into that site and break it down by states and counties and take a good look at what's happening in your region, specific to your area. All right, and know what's happening. Um, in general, all right, we know males are at higher at risk. USLA has tabbed that it's a five to one ratio. All right, we know toddlers are at risk. Some of you have seen the pool um, uh, safely program when we've talked about young children. All right, we know that alcohol is a factor. All right, um, when I worked at Wildwood um, Crest, the bars were open until five o'clock in the morning. All right. So 5 o'clock in the morning. If you heard the song, See You Later, Alligator, you knew it was going to be a long day. All right? But what I'm trying to equate to it is if people are out at 5 in the morning, that meant when lifeguards were coming on shift, people eventually were coming down to the beach to swim and somewhat wake up. I dealt with more potential drunks in the morning because they had just got done from partying. Right? It was just something we had to realize that the intoxication factor that you were getting in that first wave, or they were already down at the beach, the number of rescues that we had before, we actually officially went on. All right, so understanding what your high risk groups. And folks, high risk may be different for me in my area compared to Roy in North Carolina. There could be some various differences. All right? In South Jersey, our high risk time is really our after hour um, drownings. I can pretty much tell you when my, my toner was gonna go off. Guards went off at five o'clock, so I'd usually tell my wife that don't plan on me being home too quick because probably by 5.30 to 6.30, I'm gonna be on a night call. Because you have to pay to go to those beaches. So people would wait until the lifeguards left, and then they'd do what? Come onto the beach. So we knew where our kind of demographic and our time frame on it. So understand what you're dealing with there. Evaluation, um, some of you in the military understand the term tracking, um, different things, but we're tracking our bathers. What is their ability level? Now folks, just because Johnny or Susie that come in that's eight years old, they're swimming pretty good at the get-go, after three hours, there's a good chance they're going to be what? Tired, fatigued, so on and so forth. You need to make sure, is, what is their ability level, and are they getting worse, or are they maintaining, all right? Th it can diminish over a course of the day. So that little group of kids that came in that were doing well at the beginning of the day could diminish because they're tired. We, I see that happen a lot over a six, seven hour period, all right? What's their general appearance? If I have somebody that comes in I'll use the beach setting, for example. I have somebody that's coming in with cut-off jeans that has really no tan, and they go in the swim. What do you think their swimming ability is? How often do you think they're swimming? Probably a chance. I mean, it, it can go either way, but the chance is that they're probably not exposed to swimming a whole lot. All right. If I see somebody that's called fire engine red, they're burnt to a crisp. It's also a good chance that they're not outside, they're not overly active, and now they're out swimming. Those are some indicators that, that we've looked at over, over the years. Here's the bottom line, folks, one of the bottom lines. If you don't feel comfortable with the person's ability that's in your water, you better wave them in using a beach term. And I would tell that to our young guards. Do you feel comfortable with those five people out on that edge? Well, Lieutenant O'Gorick, no. And I go, then you better do what? Move them in. Now, the veteran guard with 20 years may have a little different comfort level. So keep your water tight. If you don't feel comfortable, you need to change the environment and the conditions that are there. Ultimately, that lifeguard's in charge of what? those people in the water that they're in. And if their comfort level is starting to get pressed, 
you need to encourage them to change the environment and the conditions that they're in and the people are in. And that means blowing the whistle and educating the people. But how many lifeguards are really willing to do that? Most are reluctant to blow the whistle and to engage. You have to encourage that once you get past a certain comfort level. Remember my story about Ninth Street Beach? Ninth Street's not hard if you engage and keep it tight and don't let it get out of control. Signal the bather, all right? No different at the beach than in a um, shallow, deep pool. Could you move into shallow water? That kid that was doing fine, now that's getting tired, maybe the rest of the day you need to do what? Move into the shallow water. Still have an enjoyable day, but make it safe for them. All right, scan um, as far as the assessment. Scan the areas that you're assigned, identify bathers and needs. Now I look at it at level one, two, and three. You may look at it on a whole different things, but this is what worked for us at the beach. Level one, somewhat minor. It's a preventable action. You have somebody that's moving into areas that they shouldn't or they're doing an activity they shouldn't do or you don't feel comfortable with it, it's a preventable action. Wave them in. Educate them. Tell them why they're not supposed to do it. What's an appropriate behavior? I, I look at things, I, my mentor at IUP, Ralph Johnson, um, had um, signs uh, and he goes, notice it doesn't say no. Like the NFL and turns out to be in the no fun league, we say no, 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 no. I love the signs he had. It says this is the behavior that we want. All right, so I, when we're doing public outreach or prevents, we try to tell people what is an appropriate behavior versus a no behavior. All right, so wave them in. Now, folks, um, those of you who are trying to um, justify your jobs and your budgets, every time a lifeguard, I tell this to the beat, every time a lifeguard blows a whistle or says you need to move in or educate you about doing something, that's a prevent. So if you're writing notes down, I call that a prevent. That's a tally. So at the next day, at the end of the day, I'd say, make sure that you turn in all your preventable measures that you did. And every lifeguard should have a list of preventable measures. If I want the lifeguards to come in and say, Lieutenant O'Gorick, I had 25 prevents yesterday. They have done public education, and I keep track of it. Because oftentimes our city council and our administrators, they go, well, there's no drownings. What do, do we need lifeguards? Well, justify it because your guards are actually doing preventable measures. Just document it. Level two, distress. Um, there's some are starting to struggle. Um, you, you know, they, if they're in distress, they have voluntary control of their movements and can call out for help, possibly call out for help, uh, and look for indicators. Some of the indicators we look at at the beach are low strokes, low heads, heads together, usually means kids grabbing each other, holding on, um, inadvertently catching waves. I usually call that mother ocean throwing a bone to us because they catch a wave and they get pushed in. All right? um, could be the same thing at a wave park, all right? wave pool, getting pushed into shallow water. Um, hair in the eyes. It's in, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot of long hair, but if I had long hair, if you had hair that went in your eyes, the first thing you want to do is what? Sweep it out. If you see that, that's an indicator they're in distress. Bugged out eyes. All right? there's, a, there's a list of 100 things that you know. The difference between sometimes guarding at the beach and at a pool is that for the most part, most of our rescues, 80% of them, if not higher, are distress indicators versus the instinctive drowning response. And I think everybody here should know the instinctive drowning response. We have critical elements of head back, person's not able to call out for help, Arms are pressing down laterally, little to no kick. All right, I'll give you another distress indicator um, with the kicking. I look at extremes. Major amounts of kicking to no kicking. Usually they blow their legs out and then they can't move their legs. Any competitive swimmers in here? All right, how many people love swimming the 200 freestyle? All right, my coach always put me in the 200 freestyle. And I, but the last 25, I couldn't feel like my legs would move. All right, same thing, all right, uh, on that. With the instinctive drowning response, if you're not doing this in your class, please think about this. I have all my students do this. I ask them to yell the word help as loud as they can while they're taking a breath in. So I'm going to ask you to do that. A little bit of an effective domain here. I want you to yell the word help as you're inhaling. 
on three. Don't cheat. One, two, three. Uh, you're cheating. <gasps> when you're drowning or in the instinct of drowning response, your number one function is to breathe. And if that's to take in air, you can't verbalize. All right, assess. If you need assistance, you need to activate the emergency action plan. All right. Next lecture, I'm going to be talking about EAPs and incident command systems. Hopefully you'll come. We'll kind of bridge you to the ICS. Otherwise, continue to scan, target, assess. Notice what I'm doing. Big, smaller, detailed. All right. The rescue part. Folks, uh, you can add a bullet before this, all right? But these are usually the four critical elements that we press upon. But approach stroke, approach, contact, control, support, and verbal reassurance, all right? Let me remind you of this. Now, you see, when I trained our firefighters, they're like, we got to get out there, we got to grab the person, and we got to rush to get them back out onto the beach or under the boat or under the deck. And they go, well, that's great you're getting out there. But you got to realize that there's two main functions for somebody who's in distress or drowning. They want what? Air and support. Once you give them that, things calm down pretty quick. So if you think about these critical elements, contact, control, support, and verbal reassurance. And your incident's pretty well wrapped up. It's not over, but you can pretty well control your, your rescue at that point. All right, removal. It's probably one of those things that we just don't overly think about. We just do it. All right, but you really should put some thought process on it. Determine, is there additional lifeguards needed? I remember being on a rescue. I went out to grab um, two, two or three young children in a rip current. I swam out. I buoyed them. I got them. I said, you, uh, kids, you're okay. And they pointed. And as I was going out, I remember they got caught in a rip current. Right? After I got past a certain point, other kids that were behind me got caught in the rip current. It went from three to six. So I have six kids on one buoy in my head, and I'm sitting there going, man, I hope my sand partner wasn't dilly-dallying around. All right? Did I need backup? Yes. All right? So understanding if additional guards are needed. Um, select the best extraction route, all right? whether it's your pool or the waterfront. All right, know where to move. If I have a spinal injury and it occurred potentially in the deep end of the pool, let's just say hypothetically, and it's a shallow deep, do I want to extricate them out of the deep end of the pool or go to where I can get to the shallow end? So think. Oftentimes, though, in your training, throw that scenario out. Some of you are already doing it, and you'll notice the guards won't think about that critical thinking skill. They'll just automatically go to what they think is the shortest point, which actually is the... Um, you know, more escalating or, or higher level things on it. Um, monitor vital signs. We often forget about monitoring the vital signs. Uh, removal techniques, um, you know, is it a spinal injury? Is there backboard needed? Um, right, quick fun slide here. You realize, folks, we've been doing lifeguarding for 100 years. I, I like to throw this slide up. Anybody know what year this is from? Take a guess. Do a little trivia thing. But take a good look at what they're doing. Any, anyone get a guess of the year? If Bruce Wago is here, he'd be wanting to steal this picture. 1928. Let me see if this laser works. At least 1928. OK? Now, we don't use this method. But what's that? Oxygen. Lee, you and you and I worked on some various articles. There were a long time, there was a few decades that, ooh, lifeguards shouldn't use oxygen. And then we usually get the, well, it's the newest, greatest thing. Well, I'll let you know that we've been doing it actually a lot longer than you think. All right. Reevaluate your primary and secondary survey once you're out of the water. Folks, just because you're out of the water doesn't mean you're done for the day. All right, Rec record the incident. All right, records and reports are very, very important. Too often, lifeguards are asked by their supervisors, go ahead, get back up on the chair. Who knows the most about the incident? Who knows what happened? 
the lifeguard. Roy's going to be talking about collecting data. He doesn't need the aquatic director filling out that information. He needs the lifeguard who actually made the rescue in cooperation with the manager. But that lifeguard is the one that knew what was occurring. The other thing you've got to be aware of, too, is that sometimes it's traumatic for individuals. You may be dealing with critical incident um, stress debriefing. So you've handled and packaged a person, and they went off to the emergency room. Have you, as a supervisor, taken time to go up to the lifeguard who's quiet, sitting in the corner, and ask how they're doing? And are you ready to go back to work, or do we need to do some debriefing? And we oftentimes forget that as facilitators that things are traumatic. So the evaluation just isn't about the records and the reports. It's also about making sure that your staff is ready to go. Once again, my next lecture, I'll do my little PR thing, is going to talk about the recovery phase of incident command. All right, debriefing and counseling. All right, so wrapping it up, scan. I feel like I'm doing the YMCA thing. Scan, target, assess. Scan, target, assess. Scan, target, assess. If you're not assessing, you're not doing your job as a lifeguard. If I see that the individual in the far end of my beach needs to be rescued or is getting too far away, now I have to make a decision to do a prevent or intervene and make a rescue, find the best way to remove them, and then to finish out with records and reports. All right. So this is Kim Tyson and I way of trying to let our lifeguard candidates and our students, and hopefully all of you, take a simple acronym so you can use on an everyday basis and go up to your guards, and if you teach this in, in your program and go, remember your star. And hopefully while they're in there, they're thinking, scan, target, assess, scan, target, assess. And then when you know what hits the fan, they remember that rescue and remove, along with a whole bunch of other R's. Thank you. I hope, I hope there's one thing, I always say this in my lesson, if you walked away with one new idea or thought process, just one, then it was a very successful time for you to come here. And I appreciate you taking the time to be here and learn about the STAR method. I think I need to open it up to questions then. It's either a really good sign, I did either a great job, or I bored the living heck out of you. But hopefully, it was the other. Yes. I, I don't. I know that there may be some facilities and some of you here that will do that. Um, my approach on the reward factor, and, and at least with my beach patrol, is that, that they're given a job to do, um, and part of that job is to, is to make rescues and do prevents. And that um, I, it, it's kind of rewarding them for a job that they already should be doing. Now, I know certain facilities will do that. I've never done that. So I think you've got to look at what motivates your staff and what works for you. And if that's something that's going to motivate to get, get that up a lot higher, um, then super. I think, you know, the, with my beach patrol, it's about, once again, making sure that our jobs are justified and that we make sure that we got a good pay. And they, their reward was in that, that union contract, if you will, that they were getting. And to justify that the, the end was that we were doing, you know, 100,000 prevents each year, I think they saw another type of reward. But I know some places that may do, um, you know, uh, lifeguard of the week because they did X number of prevents or, or so on and so forth. I think whatever works for you is, is, is a good thing. But the main thing is that we need to do a better job facilitating our profession and justifying the jobs that we're doing. I mean, prevents are a really good thing. I watched Pennsylvania, where I worked for my first 10 years, um, that had an outstanding, an outstanding open water lifeguarding program. 600 open water lifeguards. There are less than 90 left, and they're on Presque Isle State Park. They eliminated every lifeguard in the state park system. And you know what a big part of it was? No one's drowning. I said, what do you ever think about the fact that no one's drowning? Is because they're actually doing their job. 
that following summer, the summer they did it, I believe there were three drownings within that state park or state park system. Um, so I, I think we need to be good stewards of showing the public that, um, that with the prevents that we are doing a fair amount of work. So very good question and, and like I said, use it to how you see, I think, fit on that. Well, I think probably a lot of you are you're doing some type of mentoring or shadowing program. Um, I've actually, with a colleague of mine, um, uh, you know, part of my role at phys uh, in physical education department is pedagogy. So we used to use these um, rubrics to um, have our students go in and shadow a teacher, and, and every 30 seconds they would do a task sheet. So one of the things that, that I started using with the beach patrol is a shadow guarding grid. I made a grid up. So that um, when we were doing um, young lifeguards, I could use it for two methods, but the lifeguard candidates would go and watch back beach veteran guards. And every 30 seconds, they had a tally. Now, some of the criteria was watching the water. So if the guards are doing their job every 30 seconds for 30 minutes, there should be a what? A tally. But if they were talking to friends, and they did it for five minutes, every 30 seconds they're getting a tally they were off task. If they made a rescue and it took two minutes, they got a tally for every 30 seconds. Now with that shadow guarding grid, I could set down with a tangible, direct data-driven sheet that says that, I'll, I'll use Lee and I are friends, so Lee, you just spent five minutes talking to a person on that 30 minute shift. You spent 80% of your time watching the water, 15% of your time not watching the water, and 3% of the time was on such and such, which is a lot better than just saying I caught you watching or talking to somebody. So shadow guarding can be really good. And well, how we used it was to make those younger guards understand how important watching the water was and what the job was, a, was about. But it also allows it in other ways, as far as shadowing those veteran guards, if it's more of an interactive thing, to share with them how the, the setup is. So, very good question. If you're interested in that shadow guarding grid, please let me know. It's a, and we have it adapted for different things. So, Lee. I, I have a hard time hearing that. Yeah. What okay. is the difference between this and the elephant coaches on the slide and the fish that you have here? How is it different? Um, okay. Uh, I'm not an Ellis instructor, so uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to give you the, the fairest thing. I, I don't know another acronym that's being used. Maybe that there are with other um, programs, but I'm sure there's some paralleling. Um, critical elements. I mean, folks, it's not rocket science on this. It's just another way of trying to get our candidates to embed into their head just not to sit there and stare at the water. It's more of an engagement factor. Um, so not being an Ellis guard, um, I don't know if I can give the fairest uh, question on that, but um, I think with this acronym, um, as a beach lifeguard, as a pool lifeguard, it, it's, and as an instructor, it's allowed us the opportunity to remember major components on the observation and major components within the rescue and application process. And then whether you're an Ellis Guard, a NASCO, or USLA, you can adapt this in any way that fits that program if you choose to.